This is the Balanced Growth Show with Dr. Travis Perry, helping successful business professionals like you achieve balance in their lives. Welcome to another episode of the Balanced Growth Show. I'm your host, Dr. Travis Perry. Today we have with us in studio Bree Schmidt. Bree is an absolutely incredible person and uh, very accomplished. She has several businesses. One is she's the managing broker of the Second City Real Estate. It's a full service brokerage working with investors in the Chicago market. She's also the owner of BBS Apartments and she's the founder or co founder of the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit. It's a weekend educational summit for real estate investors, which she just wrapped up recently. And now she has time to be with us on the show. Welcome, Bree, to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Tell us how did you get into real estate, real estate investing? What what brought you in? How did you get to running these three different companies and doing it so with balance? It didn't start out intentionally, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, I had always had a passion for real estate. I went and got licensed. I actually started working for an agent as an assistant when I was 19 years old. I went and got licensed the day I turned 21, which was like the legal minimum in my state. I quit my job, like I was going to be a real estate agent, and I hated it. I hated it. I failed. After nine months, I was like, this is not me. This is terrible. I'm out. And I went to go work in advertising sales for almost another 10 years. So it really came about when I was looking for a house in Chicago with my fiance. Um, you know, we were looking at different neighborhoods, different houses, right? Big single family houses were too expensive for our budget, but we wanted something we can grow into. And Chicago has about, depending on the area, between 50 and 70% of the housing stock are these two to four unit properties. You might call them duplexes, triplexes. Uh, so really the intention was to just buy one of them. And eventually when we needed more space, we could take out a staircase and add this. And then now we've got two floors. And then eventually we can take over all three floors and have a single family house. So that was the end game was to buy one property, continue working for the rest of our lives uh, unfortunately, about nine months later, my dad passed away from a very aggressive form of cancer. And he ended up dying the day literally before he was supposed to retire. And so we had already planned his retirement party and had to convert it into his wake. And he was 60 years old, but he got a very quick cancer. And I just kept sitting up at night thinking about all the times he would tell me, you know, when I retire, I'm going to go do this. You know, when I retire, we're going to go to Thailand. And after, you know, all these different things he wanted to do with his life was always after he retired. And he kept telling me, you know, after you get married, I'll retire. After your brother finishes his PhD, I'll retire. And then life took the, you know, took the rug right underneath him. And he never got to do any of that. And I sat there and just thought, I hate, like, I don't hate my job, but like, this is not the life that I want. Like I've been traveling for work for years. I work 60 hours a week. I'm in all these different airports, you know, 24 seven, I'm on my phone, emailing clients. I'm always available. Like, what am I going to do with my life? Cause something needs to change. So really I sat down with my husband and looked at, you know, what are we going to do with our lives? What gives us the ability to travel and be flexible? You know, we looked at, hey, should we quit our jobs and be, learn to code? You know, is that something that we should do? And we looked at a bunch of different options and real estate. So we already had that triplex for about a year now, uh, became the, the, the uh, vehicle, right, for our, our movement. So I started buying more properties. Uh, you know, another year or two goes by, I ended up quitting my corporate job to do my, to run the portfolio full time. Um, the rest really just came out of, you know, natural things that happened. I was at a networking event with someone and they had told me like, Hey, I heard you on a podcast. Like you are doing exactly what I want to do with my life. I work in corporate. I want to get into real estate investing. Like, can you help me? And I had said, well, my license is still active. I haven't done, I haven't taken on clients in over a decade. I hated it before. Um, I don't have a car either. We live in Chicago. So I'm legally, I can help you find properties, but it's something I've never done before. And so he would pick me up every Saturday and we'd go look at properties. And, you know, then another person heard what I was doing and wanted me to help them. And that's how the business really grew was, was random people just started asking me to help them find properties. I ended up having to get in my own car eventually. Um, so I could actually drive clients to appointments. Uh, but that's how the business started almost nine years ago. 
And because of that, I mean, it sounds like you were struggling with balance, right? Being gone so much and really not having the lifestyle you wanted and your father, um, you know, thank you for sharing because I know that it resonates with me uh, because my father died two weeks before his 50th birthday and we had, we're throwing oh. him a surprise party and is the same thing. We were going to yeah. celebrate and instead we, you know, had a funeral. Yeah. Um, so I, I I feel you like that. It was a catalyst. It sounds like in your life, like it wasn't mine to make big changes. Absolutely. And different. Cause you yeah. sit there, you know, I was, I wasn't even 30 yet when it happened and was like, am I going to spend the next 30 years of my life working like this for what, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, for what really, you know, to, to dream about all the cool things you get to do and then never get to do them. Um, so yeah, it was a huge catalyst for me. Um, said the rest kind of grew out of that, right? I didn't really have a plan. I didn't have a plan to start a brokerage. I didn't have a plan to start a conference. Um, I just decided that I need to start making my own rules and figuring it out as I go. Right. Um, and that's what I did. You know, then we started a conference business in 2017 as well. But at the end of the day, like it was about before I had, I started having kids in 2019. So it was about 2017 when I realized I was still working more than I did in corporate, you know, because the problem with my business is it's reactive. You know, something happens at a property, right? A furnace goes out or, you know, a, a tenant decides to move out in the middle of the night. Like that morning you woke up thinking that you had, you had your plate full, you had a, what you had to do today. Right. And then something else kind of comes into it. Same with the real estate side of things, you know, five new properties get listed that are all good properties and your clients want to see them today, guess what? You need to drop everything and go do it. So I was available, you know, my clients was calling, emailing, texting 10 o'clock at night, um, weekends, nights, everything. I was in a place where I couldn't step away and had to then relearn why I got into this in the first place. Right. And why, what my, what my goals were. Um, so my goals before I had kids was to not wake up with an alarm. Um, now I have small children who 530 is when they get up in the morning. So there's no longer <laughs> you a, a have choice. Alarms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have alarms. Right. But for, I had a good stretch. I had yeah. a good stretch of being able to wake up when my body naturally wanted to, right? Love it. Um, that will come back to me someday soon, but I don't have to get up for work, right? That was what was important. I'm not getting up to go get ready and go commute an hour somewhere. Um, another thing was important was, you know, learning to take time off work. Um, you know, I try to, we try to travel at least two months out of the year. Um, one of those trips is usually a month long, right? That was a huge, uh, there was built up anxiety, right? About leaving for a month, right? And having to, you know, what's going to happen when things are gone. Um, you know, those were also what was one of my uh, main goals. Um, and then building off of there. So I had to reshift everything and change it back in 2017. Yeah. No, I love it. I'm giving you a hard time, but I, you know, I, we have young children and it's like, I haven't turned on an alarm clock and I don't know how, you know, unless <laughs> I have to get up abnormally early to catch a flight or something like once yeah. in a while, but it's there as a clock so I can see it. But you're, you're, I love the idea. Like you wanted flexibility. You wanted what you, you know, you saw your father basically not have in his life, just this constant waiting right yeah. around for this one day to happen. And you wanted to live that. So that's fantastic. Why is this flexibility, this freedom um, so important to you? It kind of begs the question, like we've just been talking about, right? But why is it then so important to you to keep this balance while you're scaling your business, while you're growing these businesses? Well, the balance is necessary for sanity, right? Um, also, again, you know, when my kids are one and three and a half, so they still require a lot of attention. Um, they're not in daycare. They're home all day with my husband and I. And we, you know, usually after in the afternoons, we go do family time, right? We want to spend quality time with our children. Uh, the same time, though, I need to support my family, for my kids to not be in daycare, for my husband to be able to stay home with the kids and for us to be able to have those things and do those things and travel, right? Someone's got to pay for it. Um, and right now that person is me. So you have to have one with the other, right? And that's the challenge is as you build more business, um, 
you know, how do you still maintain that? Like my goal is always 30 hours a week is my max that I want to work. So one of the things that I had to do back in 2017 was I sat down for about a month, right? And every day at the end of the day, I wrote down what I did with my day, right? I spent two hours on accounting. I spent three hours on marketing. I spent two hours talking to clients, right? And at the end of the week, I I tallied it up in a spreadsheet and looked back in the week and said, okay, I am spending 10 hours a week with marketing, right? I'm terrible at marketing. I'm not very good with marketing. What can I do to reduce that time and outsource that, right? And what's my time worth? So I decided that my time is worth about $200 an hour. So if I could find someone else to take over that 10 hours a week, right? And spend less than $200 an hour, then that was worth my time. So the next week I did the same thing. At the end of the day, every day I wrote down what I was doing, right? And then now that I have two hours a day back in my time, right? What should I use that time for, right? And the answer for me was, you know, revenue generating activities. You know, how do I generate more clients? So this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, right? Going back and forth and tweaking my schedule and looking at where I'm doing my time, finding things to outsource and certain things I don't outsource. Like I love accounting. I'm a total dork. I have 18 bank accounts, right? I've got 2000 transactions a month and I get everything over to my CPA by January 15th. You know, like I am on accounting, but I love it. Like it is not something that is boring to me. It is something that I enjoy doing. So that is something that I don't outsource. And also for me, because I have so many different businesses and LLCs, for me, it's something that I am now staying in tune with my business, right? I'm actually reading through the reports. Uh, I know what's going on instead of just getting, uh, you know, something from a bookkeeper. Um, But that was really what started the process, right? Was understanding where your time spent, how to optimize that time, and then how to get that down to, let's say, six hours a day you know, and then furthermore, you know, how to get down to four or five hours a day. Right. And, and that was the process that I started doing. Very cool. Yeah. You know, I'm a big proponent of time management, having an ideal calendar, looking at where you're spending your time, as you know, um, for our book, Achieving Balance. But, you know, this is, this is something that I find most people, they want change, but they never track it. And the only way you're going to change something is if you do exactly what you just explained is you have to Track it, period. I've got these smart watches, things that are just telling me to stand up. It tells me when to breathe. I mean, it it tracks all of my exercise if I allow it. Like I know how much time I'm looking at screens. It's too much. <laughs> and the only way we're going to change anything is if you start to track it. So that yeah. that became something that you've done in the past. Do you continue to do that? Do you stay on top of it now? What 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 is your you know your schedule look like? It varies, you know, again, having three businesses every day is different. Um, I follow, I'm a to-do list. I have a very strong, uh, control, like what is what I'm looking for? Um, I have a very strong need to have a to-do list, right? Like my to-do list is my, my end all be all. It is the cornerstone of my day. The first thing I do in the morning is I review my to-do list and start planning things out in the day. Um, there's, um, I've got it broken down by different sections, right? I've got different businesses, my personal, you know, everything that needs to be done. Uh, first thing in the morning, I try to go through and do all the small things, you know, and knock them off the list, right? If it takes less than five minutes, then I try to get those done in a row. Um, so again, 30 minutes will give me six tasks that I can do. And then you start off the day with a much smaller to-do list and you start feeling more accomplished with it, right? Um, secondly, I break up my to-do list and things that have to get done today. And I try to put things on the to-do list that don't need to be done for like another, let's say two or three weeks. Right. So I'm also a big, uh, believer in working when you have the energy. So there's days we all have these days, right. Where you wake up and you're just not in the mood, you know, you, your kid threw up in your bed, you haven't slept more than three hours or your baby's teething, right. Those days, I just take the day. Monday last week was one of those days. My baby ha- was in some sort of mood. He was screaming and crying all day long. And I just turned off my phone and took the day off, right? Because I wasn't going to get anything done. But there's some days where I wake up at five o'clock in the morning, so full of energy and like ready to just start going through stuff. So those are the days that I really focus on what needs to get done in the next two weeks and start knocking those things down off the list as well. 
Yeah, you know, there is this idea that time management and being productive is the end all be all. But what you mentioned there is that energy and yeah. priority management that that, yeah. that trumps time management. And I agree, like time management is important. It's a good tool. But without having the right priority and, and really managing your energy, when I teach people how to manage their time and, and, and their priorities, you know, why do something in the morning if that's drudgery? If it's better in the afternoon, do it in the afternoon. And there's times and seasons like I mix up my workouts and I, you know, I can't necessarily go mountain biking at 5 30 in the morning in the wintertime. Like <laughs> there are just some things you've got to move around. And I love that you talk about this flexibility, this idea that if you're not going to do your best work, it might be better just to scrap it um, and to be flexible. Yeah. So I, I love that. Think love about that a day. Concept. So, you know, said, uh, accounting is a really big thing for me. Um, you know, it's going to take me, let's say, to do a full month's accounting work, it's going to take me about six hours to go through it, right? Um, if I'm off or not focused or being yeah. interrupted, that six hours takes me 10. But if I'm like in the mood and I'm in the zone and I can, you know, go down in my office and like turn off my phone, I can get done in four. And then I feel so accomplished, right? Then I want to do more. What else can I do? Right. What else can I knock off my to-do list? That's a challenge. Uh, but when it's I start messing up numbers and I'm, you know, doing calculations wrong, like then it's no good for anyone. No, and it uh, you're you're doing you're doing yourself a disservice. So absolutely. I, I think that's really important. Energy management, priority management, overtime management, any day. Well, uh, what would you say is your Achilles heel when it comes to trying to scale and keep this balance, right? That you've described, that you've created, that you've worked really hard at keeping and, and really um, trying to do each week and every day. What is it that you might struggle with? I know everyone appreciates like pulling back the curtain and say, hey, this is where I struggle. This is what I'm, you know, uh, terrible at. And, and trust me, I'm balanced, man. I, and I struggle with lots of things, but it's great on the show for people to hear. Yeah. That I struggle with that too. And even though you have great balance, what is that for you, Brie? You know, I have to, every few months, essentially like readjust things and, and put things back into perspective. Cause again, in my world, I've got very little control over my business. You know, I got I could have no clients looking at houses this week and I could have 40 next week. You know, same thing with the, the real estate business, right? I could have all my tenants paid rent this month, right? And no one needs anything from me. And then next thing you know, like house burnt down or there's, you know, issues that need my attention. So I just, I don't really have a, you know, set time like, oh, I can only do 30 hours this week, right? There's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days. You know, there's going to be good weeks. There's going to be bad weeks. Um, I do find that I struggle with losing focus and having to go back and start chart. Like if I'm not tracking things, right, I've got to go back and start tracking things again um, and kind of go back to the basics for me. Um, that really helps me recenter and refocus things. And again, it's not a, what worked for me four years ago doesn't work for me today. So it's an ongoing process. It kind of has to be, um, you know, let's just say, for example, that you know, my kid changed their nap schedule, you know, where I used to work in the mornings, but now my kid needs a, you know, an afternoon nap. So now I've got to adjust my schedule, right? Those are all things that it's just a constant, it's constant progress, right? You got to be flexible. Yeah. That flexibility is definitely key. And I think as you've mentioned, you've got to be firm on things in order to be flexible. You got to be firm and say no to a few things in order to be able to allow that time. Because if you had clients meeting in your office every day and your kid throws up and you didn't have any sleep, you'd have to cancel all those appointments or you'd have to you know, some, figure some things out. So you got to build that flexibility in. Um, and if, if that's expectations with your clients or that you're not meeting with clients every day, um, I don't. There's no way. I, there's no way I can be creative and write books and do podcasting and speak on stage. Like you can't um, if if you want that flexibility. But if you have that rigid structure and you know when you can move things around, it becomes a breeze. Uh, pun intended. <laughs> so there you go. Dad jokes all day long. That. <laughs> First of all, no is my favorite word. Um, I even not even being a parent. I love like when I learned to say no to people, that was a real game changer for me because you feel obligated, 
you know, yeah. Hey, let's go grab a coffee and chit chat, you know, or like, Hey, I just like, you get emails on LinkedIn, right. Every single day, you know, I am able to do use some big word for other companies, just like yours and in your industry. Like, let's do a 15 minute call. It's just 15 minutes. No, I will not do that phone call unless you can tell me what your business is right? And why it's worth my time to take this phone call. I'm not taking that phone call, right? I absolutely no, will not do it. The second thing for me was I don't do anything in person unless I'm meeting a client at an actual property doing a showing. I don't, this is before COVID even, I don't do any in-person meetings because it's not a good use of my time, right? I'm a female. I've got to put on makeup. You know, I've got to do my hair and look presentable, right? So that's at least a half an hour, which you guys don't have to do. I live in Chicago, right? Traffic is terrible. So for me to just go have, let's say a 30 minute coffee break, right? That's an hour of prep and driving for me to get there. Then we've got to have a half an hour meeting where we're just chit chatting, right? There's not actual, you know, we're getting to know each other. Right. Um, but I can't look at my phone. So now I'm getting backed up on work and then it's another half an hour home. So right now that's two hours out of my day. And now I need another hour to even catch up on things. So that's really three hours out of my day for something that would have been just as effective with a 30 minute phone call. Yes, I 100% agree. No is one of the best words ever. I did a whole training on this before and threw some, you know, um, shade at those who are, yes, it, 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 it is because if you're a pleaser, yeah, And especially for client focus, which most of the people listening are, uh, they have clients. So they want to help and please their clients. And they find themselves getting stuck that if they just say yes to every client, like I, I like to bring up this point. If you had two clients calling you at the exact same time, who do you say yes to? Who do you say no to? Because people, oh, Travis, I can say yes to everyone. I get back to everybody. Blah, blah, blah. And there's no mm-hmm. way. There's no way you can. You're fooling yourself. Or what I call a do it all. And you think you can do it, but you're not Superman. So if you had two competing things at the exact same time, you have to decide what's the highest priority. And if you don't have a system for that, it's easy to be the yes person, isn't it? Absolutely. We're we're taught to be nice. You know, we're that's just, you're you're being polite by saying yes. Of course, like, but no is much better for you. Um, yeah. On that same point, we, one of the things we changed in our business a couple of years ago was we started declining clients, right? We started setting up a criteria of, Hey, you know, this is what 90% of our clients are looking for. And that's what we're going to focus on. So we're very specialized. Um, so I've got a team of eight agents. All of us have are specialized by geography and what asset class we work with. Um, and that's all we do. So we formed a team where if someone comes to me and says, you know, Hey, you know, I'm looking for mixed use properties, right? That is not me. That is Ronan, you know? And so that goes to Ronan. That's his area of expertise, right? If Ronan finds a client that's looking at house hacking on the North side of Chicago, that goes to me, right? So we've learned to specialize and get really, really good at our specialty and then share the business between each other so that we're not overextending ourselves just to say yes. So our process is a little bit different. A lot of agents will say, you know, oh, you get a phone call and the, the, the agent, right. Is selling themselves, right. Why should you work with me? We're kind of opposite. Um, our initial phone call is really going over what the client's expectations are. Um, we want to hear, you know, what's your budget, what areas, you know, what, what are you looking for in a property? Then we send them specific examples, real life examples that we've sold or seen. And then we set up a phone call to talk through it. Cause a lot of times they're like, oh, well, I was expecting to get X, Y, Z out of these properties. And I can tell them right up, you know, that's not possible. You know, we just had one the other week, the client gave me an idea, like an idea of what they wanted. And I told them that's not realistic expectations. Here's what's realistic, you know, and what you're looking for, you know, and how much work do you, are you willing to do? Um, and they decided that they were no longer interested, that they were going to take another year, keep sure. saving, right. Change their priorities because what was achievable for them was not what they wanted. Yeah. You know, I work with clients every day, help them figure out who is their ideal client. And a lot of people, I'll take them if they at least have this, this, and this. No, don't tell me minimums. What's your ideal? Who Mm -hmm. is your ideal? What kind of personality they, because they may check all the boxes on the demographics, 
But if you don't like working with them, their personality doesn't light you up. You don't enjoy when they you see that phone call or the Zoom on the calendar, like I get to talk to this person today. If they don't light you up and, and you don't really enjoy serving them, they're not ideal. They're just not. They'll drain your energy, which we talked about energy management, right? They'll drain your energy. They'll cause problems and they're not helping you to scale your business. It's not a win-win. So sometimes saying no to those people could save you tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars of energy and time and and everything else that you're doing as you're building a business. So I, I really appreciate you mentioning this. I appreciate the time you've been able to spend with us today. I know we could go on for hours. It seems like there's so much great content here we could dive into, but Bree, this has been a, a treat for us to have you. If you could leave other entrepreneurs or business owners with some words of advice as you've been able to grow your business and keep that balance at the center of what you're doing, what would that be for them? Write down your goals, right? Your goals with your life. You know, I want to increase sales by 125%, right? I want to coach my son's little league game. You know, whatever those goals are, write them down, put them next to your desk, right? And it doesn't need to be, you know, an overnight process, but every day look at what those goals are and figure out how you can make adjustments in your business to get to those goals. And that it might take, it might take weeks. It might take months, right? You know, read books, educate yourself, listen to podcasts, right? Figure out a way, how can I do this to increase my sales, but still spend time with my kid, right? And there's a ton of different ways of doing those. Yeah. Great advice. I appreciate you being on the show. If others want to reach out to you and get in touch with what you're doing, learn more about you, where, where can they go? Sure. My website is www.secondcity-re.com. Awesome. We'll have that in the show notes. Thanks for being here again. And guys and gals, if you listen to this and you enjoy our bantering back and forth, like, share, subscribe, do all the things that will help this continue to be a top 20 podcast and beyond. We're excited to bring you more content like this in the future. And thanks again, Bree, for being part of it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Remember everyone, until next time, live life on purpose. <laughs>